joyful noise and a shout of triumph to the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise you this morning, Lord. We pray that we would just shake off whatever happened this week, Lord, and that we would come into your presence and give you glory and give you the honor. Do your name, Lord, for you are worthy. And we, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you that he became sin, that we can become his righteousness. Hallelujah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and he carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. from hell
is in you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. I heard the Savior say,
Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Thank you for your presence in the house, your presence in each one of us. We love you, Lord. his love for us how deep the father's love for us we'll never know we'll never understand the kind of love a father has for us and even greater than that is to know that he took his only son his only begotten son and poured him out as an offering for our sin. And the weight of that falls on me sometimes and it's just more than I can more than I can more than I can bear because I want to do more. I want to look more like Jesus. I want to do what he did. I want to practice the things he did. In his life when he prayed and he poured out his life for his disciples. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his
but I know this. You finished it. You accomplished it. And the veil was torn. And because of that, Lord, I can come into the very presence of the living God with the blood of Jesus speaking for me at the mercy seat. Lord, with a love like that, all we can do is be just overwhelmed. And we are overwhelmed, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I just want to encourage you. God's in the house today. And when we assemble together, this is a very special time when God's presence is corporately amongst us. And he wants the gifts of the Spirit that he has talked about in 1 Corinthians 14 to, to manifest among us as we worship together and as we love one another and as we worship and exalt him. Just listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't just want us to sing songs and leave and go home. He wants us to get something from his throne, from his presence in here today. So be open to what he has for you. I see the works of your hands, galaxies spin in a heavenly dance, oh God, now that you are so overwhelming, yes. I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and that you are so overwhelming I delight myself in you captivated by you
Glory to the Father. Amen. Amen. Glory in the highest. Amen. He deserves all our praise. Amen. Well, good morning, Grace Community Church. It's so good to see all you all this morning. You look lovely out there. I can tell God has been working in your lives. Amen. Amen. He's been doing a wonder in mine. Well, it's so good to see all of you this morning. Again, we're so glad that you came to worship with us this morning because you could have chosen to go anywhere, but we're so glad that you're with us. Amen, Grace. We're so glad that you're with us. And to our guests that are joining us online, we're glad to have you with us as well this morning. We hope that you have been blessed like we have been blessed. So we do have some, some announcements for you this morning. If you would like to bless your church family and show off your cooking skills, this is for Wednesday nights. Sign up out there in the foyer to bring a meal on Wednesday nights at the gathering at 6 o'clock every Wednesday uh, to show off your cooking skills. I know you have some. Uh, also, it is the men's breakfast, the first Saturday of every month, and this Saturday is on the 5th, this coming uh, February the 5th at 8 o'clock. So bring your appetite. Be ready to fellowship men. Come and have an awesome time. And then also we have something on February the 12th that we don't have a slide for. Uh, but you can sign up out in the foyer. We're going to have a marriage enrichment fellowship here at the church on Saturday the 12th. Uh, we're going to watch a great movie, and we're going to have some food and a time of fellowship. So come and be a part of that. Uh, it's an awesome time, so make sure you sign up so we can, so we can know who all's coming. Come on out and have an awesome time. And uh, so... At this time, as always, we're ready to have the word of God to bless our hearts and our souls from our pastor, Amen. Dr. Ben Wilkins. Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Praise God. 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 Praise
All right. Awesome. Y'all, I want to uh, just welcome you here and welcome our friends online. There'll be a virtual screen in front of me that's not really there, but it'll be there uh, pretty soon. Uh, for those of you who are online, I, I want to read from a speech. <clears throat> it's from Dr. William Lyle. I want you to play, pay very close attention to, this, to the questions that he asked. He said, I recently gave a lecture at my alma mater at the University of Florida College of Medicine. <clears throat> I asked the students a question. It was this. If I have a patient in my office that was not born in the United States, but they need a blood transfusion or else they will die, do I have a moral legal obligation to find access to, to a blood transfusion for them? And the student says, it doesn't matter what you... What it doesn't matter if they were born in the United States. They are patients, and they need to be treated as such. <clears throat> I said, okay, what, what if it's something more expensive? What if it is laser vascular surgery? But this person was not born in the United States. Do I have an obligation to treat them? They said, yes, of course. I said, well, what, is he, what if it's even more expensive? What if it's heart surgery, but they're not born in the United States? Finally, a very outspoken young man said, Dr. Lyle, it doesn't matter if they were born in the United States. We've been taught that a patient is a person and is a, entitled to respect and bodily integrity. He said, he, I answered, uh, he's saying, I answered him as he says, I agree with you, but there's one detail that I left out. These are all my real patients, but the reason they weren't born in the United States is because they haven't been born yet. You know, they're, 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 they're just as much people as people who have been born, and people don't get that sometimes. And, and so this Sunday is a Sunday that churches all across America recognize the right to life. You know, right now, science can prove that, that we are new life at the moment of conception. God created a shield that goes around that... A uh, uh, little that whatever that is. It's when as soon as a, a sperm fertilizes that egg, that the shield goes up, and there there's an amazing uh, depolarization of zinc ions to make that shield to protect that that new life that's just a few seconds old. And if you look, listen to this. If you look with the right frequency of light, there is a there's a flash of light that they can detect at the moment of conception. A flash of light inside there. Y'all, that's when life begins. That's when God begins a new life. Y'all, and God, God starts a new life. You know, we've got no business stopping it. But just because they haven't been born yet doesn't make them any less of a person or any less of a human being, even though they haven't been born. Y'all, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution says... Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due access. So, again, this Sunday we recognize the right to life. And right now there are thousands and thousands of little babies in this United States that are being denied the right to life. They're not even allowed to live because they're killed before they're born before they get a chance to be birthed into, the, into this uh, world we live in. Y'all, we're in our series, A New You, A New Year, A New You. The idea is that God is always working on us to change us for the better. With every passing year that you walk with God, your life will change for the better. We talked about a faith that will change you. Then we talked about freedom that will change you. Today, I want to talk to you about a love that will change you. And we're talking about a radical love that will change you from inside out. And so the most radical love in the history of the world is that God showed up on this earth and died on a cross for people who don't even like him. You know, so number one, learning to love who God created you to be. Now, and before you tune me out, I'm not talking about that self-love that the world talks about where you place yourself above 
uh, every other human being and above God himself and, and you just love yourself with whatever you doing and all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about loving who God made you to be. You know, God, you know, not making ourselves the center of our world, not talking about all that. But we're talking about being comfortable in your own skin because of the trust you, that you have in God that He made you for His purposes. Now, I want us to learn from God's Word about how to love who God created us to be. First of all, Psalm 139, 14 through 16. He says, now listen to the, the, the psalmist under the guidance of the Holy Spirit praying, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now think of, think of that. The first way we approach God in learning to love who He made us to be is, is in reverence. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. See, the psalmist is here. He's in awe of the glory of God. That God can create something like us. Y'all, it, whatever's wrong with us, we're still the most amazing thing on this planet. Right. You know, and, and uh, you know, this, he's saying this, that God, you can make somebody that can think and, and uh, create stuff and, and do all kinds of stuff, you know, that, that none of the other animals, of course, God all made them too, made all them too. But to thank him and to praise him that he made you exactly like he wanted you to be for his glory and for his purposes, if we can just get there. Now, you're looking at somebody who's never liked the way I've looked. I never have. I, I don't know why, I just, just never have. And I, and I know it's not about looks. It's about your personality and about everything like that. But for those of you who are listening on the radio, I mean, I'm, I'm six foot one. I've got real broad shoulders. I've, I'm, I've got lots of bushy blonde hair. If you just, if you just think Brad Pitt, that, that'll, be, that'll be just about it. Uh, those, these people are laughing here. They're laughing about something else. They're, they're not, uh, but, but if we can thank God and praise Him and quit comparing ourselves to other people about what we're not and what we, you know, what we wish we were and all that, and just understand that, that you made me, God, for so much more than to live, to please myself, to promote myself, to glorify myself, to pamper myself. Lord, you made me and put me on this earth for a reason. And you made me like I am for your glory, yeah. for whatever, whatever we are. And we can just learn to, to love what God created us to be. You know, and you know, God doesn't make junk. He doesn't make, he doesn't make mistakes. See, he, you were made for eternal life. You were made to live with God on this earth. And so, and, and y'all, the devil will always give you something to hate yourself for. And I think it's at the root of many addictions and struggles and, and all, the, all kinds of things because we just don't, we just don't like ourselves. We don't, but, but the key, to, I think, to that is, is coming, going past you know, what we see ourselves as compared to other people and just see ourselves as one that God has created. Yeah. You know, and, and get rid of all that, all the other that causes us to, you know, spend our lives and uh, all those things that we try to fill those voids inside of us with. So, y'all, a good place to start with loving who God made us to be is just, just say, thank you, God, I, I'm, I am who I am. Lord God, thank you that you didn't make me what everybody else wants to be. You didn't make me one of those so that I might be so full of myself, I would never feel my need for you. You know, I might, I might think I'm all that and that I don't need God. Y'all, the second way we approach God, learning to love who he made us to be, is in amazement. He says, now this is one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. When He says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, you saw my unformed body. Now what does that mean? When I was woven together in the... Look, y'all, God made us out of dirt. Yeah. 
human beings came out of dirt. You know, by the time God made humans, he had already created all the galaxy, all, all the stars, all the planets, all of that stuff. And with the most powerful telescopes that we have, we can just barely see a little bitty bit of it. And God had made all of that. And what, what we don't know is going to blow our minds someday when we see all that God created and we see all of his glory and we see everything that he's done. We just see a little bitty piece of it, y'all, from where we see. But, but after God had done all that, he said, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to make one more creation. I'm going to, I'm, this is going to amaze everybody. I'm going to make someone in my image. I'm going to make people. He's in Genesis 1, He said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Out of the height of all the creative ability that God has shown us is a human being. Y'all, the Bible says we're above angels. I don't know if you know that or not. We are above angels. We, they don't have anything on us. But go back to the Psalm 139. He says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You know, he says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You know, I said human beings are essentially made up of dirt. And then he says, when, you know, your, your eyes saw my unformed body and all that. He said, but see, God was creating us. He was gathering up the materials that he was going to use to make you. That's what he was doing, y'all. Hey, you know how women get cravings for things when they get pregnant? You know, they start, they start wanting this, this stuff. Well, what if, what are some of those craves, that, what, what if some of those things they love, uh, you know, they're not, they're not pregnant. You know, it's, it's something that they... Uh, they crave this stuff, and then they, they um, you know, then when they're not pregnant, they don't want it anymore. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Maybe it could have to do with God, what God needs to make that little human being he's making. Yeah, That's it. yeah maybe. Let's use just the standard pickles up there. Yeah. See, uh, look, at, look at this, y'all. God saw the saw the plant that made the pickles. Look at that next slide. God, God was looking at all this. And then look, God saw the dirt that would grow the pickles that he was going to use to make you. Y'all, that's what it says. When, we were, when I was formed, he says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. See, God is so amazing. Y'all, he sees it all. He sees the, the very stuff in the dirt that's going to become the pickles that your mother's going to eat because she's craving it when she's making you. Really? He said, your eyes saw my unformed body. You were seeing what you were making me into. See, long before we were even in the womb. That's why life is so sacred, y'all. We ain't got no business mess, messing with it. You know, that's a sacred thing. Did, yeah. did you know that uh, a baby in the mother's womb can have, they, uh, they already have a different DNA, but they can have a different blood type. Right. You know, they can be, they're, they're a different person. And, and we know what they say. This is my body. I can do what I want to. That ain't your body. That's a different, and, and God bless some, some y'all, we want to always treat this subject with compassion because there are some women who have been in some situations that <clears throat> we need to have compassion on them and offer God's forgiveness and let them know that they, that's, that can be forgiven just like anything else. But, but if we could now, when they have such powerful uh, ultrasound machines and all, that 80% of the time when a woman can see what a baby really is inside of her, they won't, they won't have the abortion. Y'all, look at this. He said, you could see my body even before you formed me. He said, you, you could see me, my unformed body, it would be, it, even before it ever became in the womb. Y'all, when teenage girls don't see themselves as creations of the loving God, they're quick, they're much easier to get them to do things that they, those little girls never should do. You know, when they don't see themselves the way as a special creation of God. 
And then we don't see ourselves as special creation of God. We don't present ourselves right. We send out messages that we don't have anything to offer when we go in and apply for a job or something. We hang our heads and we don't understand that we are created gloriously for God's purpose. When we ask a young lady out for a date, we know that and she knows if we know she's a fine young lady. And, and, but we don't see the value of how God made us to project that to her. We project to her, I'm not good enough for you. And she'll probably agree with you. You know, when you, when you do that, because that's just the way it is. And we, we project what, how we see ourselves. And if we could see ourselves as a special creation of God, we wouldn't do that. Look at Numbers 13.33. This is about when, when this was when God sent the Israelites to conquer the promised land. He was giving them, he was giving that land to them. But they had to fight for it, and they had to go out and take it. <clears throat> so they sent out spies into the land. And they, they, even though God had promised that he would give them that land. Look, he says, and, and so they come back, and they said, we, there in that land, we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. And they've, they've actually dug up archaeological things that these, there were some people that were pretty big, but they weren't much bigger than like professional basketball players or something are now. I mean, you know, they were like seven feet tall or something like that. Uh, but, but there are there's some, they dug up some big old beds and stuff, you know. But, and they were big. But y'all, God, just a few weeks before that, God had promised them that he would give them that land, he had destroyed the most powerful nation on the face of the earth right in front of their very eyes. He had opened up the Red Sea for them and delivered them right through that. And then God tells them, I'm going to give you that land. I delivered you then, I can deliver you now. But they went out and saw the giants and forgot about the promises of God and started seeing themselves as being about two inches tall. You ever felt like that around people? You feel like, feel like a, a little child around adults and you're an adult or something like that? You know, that's, so instead of seeing themselves as the mighty army of God that had just defeated the most powerful nation in the world and, and God gave it all to them. He, he kept His promise. It says, and so we were in their sight. See, when you walk around afraid and scared, you are smaller than what you think you are. So God wants us to see ourselves with reverence and amazement. And look, God wants us to see ourselves with purpose. See, it's hard for you to pull yourself up when you've been told all your life you're a nobody. It's, it's hard to do that. Uh, it's hard... You know, but look at, look at what God says. See, it's, but it's got to begin with seeing and believing that God has a purpose for you. Look in Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to, go, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, this is, this is, going to, this is where it's going to work out in our lives. And it's going to work out in God's purpose for us. And He made you exactly for that which God prepared in advance for us to do. He didn't make you to compare yourself with, to some other people with some other giftings and some other needs. He made you to be you. And only you can do what God put you on this earth to do. And that's all that matters. That's all that matters is that you do what God puts you on this earth to do. And in that, you'll find happiness, fulfillment, and joy. No, you, you'll find more than you ever dreamed if you just find out what God puts you on this earth for. Let's go back to Psalm 139, 16. He says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book <coughs> before one of them came to be. See, God made you especially to, especially to be perfect for what He put you on this earth for. <clears throat> God ordained for you to be in a certain place, in a certain time, 
You ought to, to do everything that he, he's given us to do. When Romans, he, sa he says, all the days were ordained for me, excuse me, uh, that written before one of them came to be. Every one of those days God has planned out for you. He says in Romans 8.31, God is for you. Who can be against you? See, when he says that, he's saying that for who he made you to be. He's not saying that for you to be dissatisfied with who God made you to be. And you wishing you could do something else. And you're always feeling upset and depressed and all because you're not like somebody else. And you can't be what they are. And you don't do what they do. <coughs> he's not saying it. He said, I'm for you. All that passage is about, uh, about how God chose us and predestined us and created us to be who, who God wants us to be. So number one, learn to love who God created you to be. And number two, learn to love those who don't love you. If you want to love that's going to change you this year, learn to love those who don't love you. Look at Luke 6.31. I'm sorry, 6.32. See, it's a pretty easy thing to love people who love you, right? It's how, I mean, how hard is that to do? It's easy. It comes naturally. But Jesus brought it, kicked it up another notch. Whole world. That's, this is just the life of Jesus. He said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Everybody does that. But to love like Jesus loves, see, we love Him because He loved us first. Yes. Everybody who, who loves Jesus or loves God, God loved them first. Yes. And so if we're going to love like He loves, we got to love people before they love us. Yes. See, He loved people with no strings attached, regardless of what they've done, where they've been, or anything else. Y'all, Regardless of what's going on in their life. Y'all, if we're going to win this, court, this culture of war, that we are involved in right now, this struggle for the soul of our nation, if God's people are going to rise to the top and, and do it, it's going to have to be from loving people one-on-one -on -one and building relationships with people and caring for them and loving them just like they are. I'd encourage you to find somebody this year. Pray and ask God to guide you into somebody's life who needs God and just love that person unconditionally and love them just like Jesus loved them. Y'all, and, and y'all, we're living, we're living in a world where people get made a man and they think they can be a woman and <coughs> they, they think they're, they're made a woman, they think they can be a man and, and they, they think they can actually change that. And, and y'all, we're, and, and you know, y'all, for a person to be that mixed up inside, they, and they may even, they may, would resent me even saying that. But y'all, for, for people to be that mixed up inside, gosh, they need loving. Yes, they, they need God's love. They need our love. They need to know some people, somebody accepts them. Yes. And just don't preach to them. Just, just love on them first. Y'all, if we're, if we're going to win this war, it will not be done politically. Right. As important it is, as it is for you to be informed and vote biblically and responsibly. Amen. That's your Christian duty. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about living a life just like Jesus lived and walking like He walked and loving people. Loving people who don't love us. You know, one-on-one -on -one relationships. And, and y'all, this requires a supernatural kind of love because a lot of them don't like us. And there may be some good reasons for that, but, but uh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But without Christ in us, we can't love people like He loves us. You know, we're not capable of that. We naturally gravitate toward loving those who are like us and, and all of that, you know. But, but without Christ, y'all, we can't, we can't love those people who are so anti-God that they don't even want to be who God made them. And, and don't want to define marriage the way God made defines it y'all that they're they're so mixed up but they need our love y'all and we better do it while we can because in Canada already already as we speak it's against the law for me to preach what I'm preaching today 
You can get put in jail for that in Canada if they get wind of it. You sure can. Already. This is not something that they're thinking about done. They've already done it. They will do it here if they could. But anyway, y'all, we can... We, we've, got to, we've got to love people. We've got the answer. Look at what Jesus did. Look at what He said to the people committing the most evil crime in the history of the world in Luke 23, 34. Look, this is what He said, the most, most evil thing that's ever been done for them to nail Him to the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all, God loves people like that. He wants us to love people like that. Now they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to find happiness. Like you and I did before we came to know Christ. But just pray and ask God to give us one person to love like that. And then don't give up on them. Even if, they, even if you know, it's a slow, long process. Y'all, let them, let them have that relationship and know there's one, there's one somebody who calls himself a Christian that really loves me. And doesn't judge me and yeah. condemn me. Yeah. So number one, learning to love who God created you to be. Mm-hmm. Number two, learning to love those who don't love you. And number three, learning to love people who aren't perfect. Oh, now here's what we're talking about doing more than just saying we love people. Look in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone was caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, <coughs> for you, you also may be tempted and carry each other's burdens. In this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Look where he says to gently means lowly, yeah. humbly. humbly. Y'all gently, humbly yes. restore those, try to restore those people. You know, don't go all high and mighty acting like, man, I got the answers and you need to listen to me. He, but he says, instead of that, be watching for yourself. The word watch, there's the word we get our word scope. He said, he's saying, be scoping out your own life. That's what he's saying to us. That's what he's saying. You be looking at your own life before you start judging everybody. He says, and look, carry each other's burdens. In this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Y'all, y'all Jesus carried our sin. He bore our sin on the, on his, in His own body on the cross. Yes. He bore all of our sin and sorrow and sickness and shame and everything. Yes. I, want, I want to close with uh, looking at this story. Just, I mean, just a couple lines from this. I love this story in Luke 15. Jesus told this story so that Religious people who were really hard on people who, who weren't perfect so that they could understand and get this. He told this story to show what God the Father is really like. And if there was anybody here on this earth who ever knew what God the Father is like, it was Jesus. And he told this story. Remember about the runaway son who took all his inheritance, went out and blew all his money. And when he's out of options, he's really not doing it because he's a good guy. He's just had not got any place else to go and he's starving to death. And so he comes home and he's saying, he talks about how he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven in Luke 15, 21 and 22. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But look at what the father he says. But the father said to the servants, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. See, there was no shaming, no beating up on him, no pointing fingers at him, no lectures. He just said, bring out that best robe. Yeah. <coughs> bring, bring the best. Restore him. Yeah. Fully, completely into my family. That's what God has for you, y'all. When you come to Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done. God restores you completely and fully. You are just as righteous as anybody else is in the sight of God. And He wants you to know that. So the message of the cross, y'all, is the greatest story ever told. It's still true today. It's true for you. Just receive it and believe it. Would you bow your heads? 
Say, Lord Jesus, I believe. Please come into my life and save me. See, if you mean business with God, God means business with you. God, and if you'd, if you'd like to talk about that, please come down to the front right down here. And you can do it after the service or you can do it right now. Uh, whatever, just come and have a seat on the front. If you're listening on, online, go to gracememphis.com and it'll tell you how to get in touch with us there. If you would like to give an offering, you know, go to gracememphis.com and click on Give. Or you can text a gift to 84321, or you can mail a gift in. But uh, the main thing is, is receiving a gift, the greatest gift that's ever been given, y'all, and it's free to you, the gift of eternal life with His Son, Jesus Christ, forever.